Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. I am Rashmi Patel, a senior security engineer at VTS and a volunteer in the OWASP community. And I'll be moderating this session. During the next 45 minutes, you will be listening to Omer Yaron, uh, present supply chain threats deserve their own incidence response plan. Please submit any questions you have during the session in the Q&A tab, just to the right of the video in the HUA app. I will be asking Omer your questions in the last 10 minutes of this session. So please note that the chat function in uh, Zoom is also disabled for attendees, but you can leave comments uh, and chat using the chat tab in HUA app. Uh, just to introduce Omer here, uh, Omer is a senior security engineer at Sneak, formerly the head of research at Enzo Security, which is part of Sneak. As part of his work for the Israeli National Cyber Directorate, Omer took an active role in IRDF, which is Incidents, Response, and Digital Forensics, of nation-level cyber attacks campaigns. He has developed certifying courses and methodologies for incidents response and triage procedures for the Israeli Cyber Emergency Response Team, SOC. Omer is a well-known speaker on AppSec-related content, both as a breaker and researcher, as well as a builder of tools and processes to mitigate AppSec risks across the entire application stack and supply chain security-related topics, including keynote speaking and participating in open panels at several industry-leading events. We are very delighted to have him today presenting for this breakout Defenders track session. Without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Omer, to take it from here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, introduction, Rashmi, and also I'm very delighted to be here. Um, let me quickly uh, share my own screen. Um, okay. okay, so um, today I'm going to speak, uh, uh, oh, sorry, not that one. Second. Second, let me just find the right slide. Okay, here we go. Um, okay. So um, today I'm going to speak about a uh, supply chain and the and and the IR plan for uh, AppSec teams and a bit about how we came to this place where it's uh, a bit hard for application security teams to deal with the uh, um, supply chain related incident response. And uh, I'm going to try and be very uh, direct about actual um, things that anyone who's in that who's in the field of uh, application security should be doing, and and they might uh, uh, be feel more secure and uh, uh, in general and specifically about uh, any kind of supply chain related issues. So uh, I'm going to skip quickly about myself, as, uh, as uh, Rashmi already introduced me. And I talk, I'll talk a bit about the agenda. So first, uh, I'm going to speak a bit about what is a, a supply chain attack vector, um, and then about why it's a, a bit of a challenge for uh, application security teams. Uh, then I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, the different threats and uh, my prediction and takeaways uh, as part of the research that we did um, of this uh, specific threat. Okay, so first of all, the the um, the incident response and the AppSec um, in general or historically, how did we get here? So uh, I'm gonna paint the, the uh, uh, at scale picture or, or from afar, right? From the, from afar, how how did uh, historically the um, the spaces of application security and IT security were divided? So historically, we used to have a, a very um, two groups. One was the application security; it was basically protecting a deployed application, which means 
going through the life cycle of any um, application, going through like the development, and including you know for modeling and and for uh, to early development until uh, final stages, and through all of those stages, we kind of had uh, uh, control or some uh, measure of of uh, application security that fits that. And that fitted that uh, stage in life of the application. So you had like a PT, a penetration testing that is performed over a deployed application. It might not be deployed in production, but it's still a live application that someone tries to break. And um, in that realm, supply chain risk, we had a static bill of material that said, this is the bill of material that consists of this application. And this is the way we and mitigate a supply chain. It means that if something off that list would tomorrow be listed as uh, vulnerable, we would be aware, we would know that it is listed there. And then on the other side, we had IT security, which mostly um, were uh, in charge of uh, the workstation of the developers, for instance, uh, what we call uh, EDRs or, uh, or antiviruses in the past. So what, whatever was flagged as something malicious happening or something, um, you know, we, we're unaware or not knowing, uh, don't know exactly what's going on in, in our developer station, then that would be in the realm of IT security, as long as, uh, as well as servers uh, kind of, um, updates and any kind of third party updates for the workstation or servers all right so the it security would have been um the main um team to uh, uphold the uh, servers um, um notion of updates and notion of an um, incident response for um any any kind of uh, issue or any kind of uh, let's say um a testament of something going wrong. And throughout the, um, over time, we were introduced to uh, agile development and the dev uh, ops kind of realm, which had a lot of shift left, um, meaning that a lot of things were becoming more and more um, code-based, including, let's say, uh, IAC or infrastructure as code. So a lot of what used to be in the realm of uh, IT security became um, applicative handles to address them. So instead of IT updating a server, some uh, someone might have instead update a code, um, a line of code that says um, this would be taken from a, a, a latest version or a different version and then redeploy that um, and which basically means that a lot of the IT security um, realm or space would actually shift into the application security um, team. So a lot of things, uh, again, scaling microservices, applicative handles for infrastructure and CI CD pipelines, all of those, which usually uh, in the historically would not be in any concern to um, application security, became a lot of the actual work for security as CI CD pipelines introduced a lot of um, kind of a, a, a vectors, right? Threat vectors. And, uh, and so IT security were left uh, a lot of the time with the developer stations. So um, they had the um, notion of we're, we need to protect the developer station and server station, which is kind of a question mark because there are uh, times where the production or other stages uh, of uh, um, other environments of uh, uh, production servers would be more of an upset. Um, concern because they were IAC and they were actually um, infrastructure as code and were district district like this uh, um, only kind of uh, available to the uh, code. Um, but there are also uh, historical uh, like I don't know jump servers and a lot of uh, out of uh, bound um, 
servers that are still uh, maintained by IT, and then it's kind of a, an, a you know, part partly managed by IT security and partly by AppSec. And again, this is like you know Broadway. Okay, so over time, the the I'd say the space of the application security be, became more and more significant and harder, I think, to maintain. Okay, so this is just like a, a recap. And then um, um, uh, a bit uh, to delve in and, and dive deep, deep into the challenges for uh, AppSec and beginning with the software uh, bill of material, right? So first of all, uh, this is, uh, uh, I think today everyone knows what a, an SBOM is and, and what, uh, what it means and why we should have it, but it's not that the case that has been like a few years back. Um, <clears throat> so um, really there are different types of software bill of materials. They are a bit similar in many ways and because they, they their intention is the same, is to describe all the different um, basically parts that, that creates the full uh, application. So um, this is uh, from uh, uh, Gartner uh, um, description of SBOM um, from last year. Um, and it's a formally structured uh, machine readable metadata that uniquely identifies the software package and the components that used to build it. Good, uh, good and nice, we have a cool uh, um, way to describe it of all the things that, uh, that comprise of our software, then we shouldn't have much of a problem. And Cyclone DX, which is really a, an OSP flagship project, um, and it's very uh, like lively maintained, uh, has a lot of different uh, um, uh, technologies that it uh, uh, relates to uh, and, and can produce a lot of uh, uh, data when it's ran over um, any project probably. Uh, and we'll give a very, a very uh, full list of uh, of uh, data that uh, a full list of, com of uh, parts that com that comprises the po the full uh, program, and the full uh, um, um, the full application. And here is a few uh, I put on a graph over uh, um, Google Trends. Um, the SBOM uh, um, search term and a few, I've put on a few um, different incidents or different um, key things that might have uh, uh, contributed to the um, notion of SBOM. So first off, it's the ESLint scope incident in July, 2018. That's the first time that I ever heard of SBOM and kind of found myself um, looking for um, kind of uh, uh, looking for something to help me realize, do I need, do I know any, uh, uh, do I have a list of uh, when and where my own, um, my own uh, application, which I was required to, right, to have to keep the security of, and um, can I really do it? So ESLint scope is, is a dependency of ESLint. It's a very well um, known lint, um, with millions of downloads uh, every week under NPM JS. Um, so that in, I was working at Wix, at Wix.com, and uh, there was a, a specific version of ESLint that was found to be malicious. Basically, someone took over a maintainer's account and pushed malicious code over a legitimate. Um, package and then we needed to answer uh, whether or not we were uh, what he did was just uh, taking the uh, npmrc file uh, which is the credentials for um, npm and kind of uh, and uh, exfiltrated it over to a uh, paste bin if i'm not mistaken so at that time like I was, okay, what's going on? Nobody kind of uh, uh, that I knew of uh, uh, really dealt with such a, a, a similar incident. And then we needed to construct a timeline and understand when and where were we uh, actually 
were our software actually being compiled and run um, as a build in our CI CD during the time of the of the malicious package was live. Um, Okay, also it's quite interesting to see the uh, actual, uh, um, the actual, uh, like how it was discovered. Someone like posted a, a po uh, uh, on uh, the GitHub, like is ESLint scope a virus kind of heading a, and basically if the attacker would have done a, a bit of a better job uh, handling uh, errors, it might have been a, a long time until it was, uh, discovered until it would have been discovered um, and then later on very later on like years after there was uh, uh, the dependency confusion um, um, article was published basically uh, explaining how one was able to um, confuse CI CD confuse CI and build uh, pipelines uh, in order to uh, prefer publicly um, malicious right um, um, dependencies over internal dependencies um, in the in the original article he, he explained how he was able to do that over like the biggest name in the industry. Microsoft, Apple, you name it. Okay, so the biggest companies, I think at least of over 30 um, of the biggest uh, um, companies were um, basically, uh, you could have uh, done that. Also, you, you, it's still basically available, like the, the, the actual um, format of the attack is still available and still in use a uh, usage uh, uh, there are a few ways to kind of uh, handle it as a as an organization but it's a very different uh type of attack than taking a uh, a legitimate um public package and kind of um making it right uh, uh, poisoning it, right, and, and taking over it and, and putting malicious code over um, uh, over some code that is uh, legitimate. Um, again, in, in May 2021, there was the first time that uh, I think a bill of material was uh, mentioned in a formal kind of uh, way by Biden's executive order, which just recently uh, came into... Um, uh, and now it's like uh, required. Um, so that was, uh, again, the first time that I think it was basically a, re a requirement for specific fields and areas of uh, um, like a FedRAMP and other uh, specific uh, um, named uh, fields, but still. Uh, this is when you, when we see the starting of a raise of uh, interest over uh, Google search. And uh, we can see in uh, uh, December of uh, 21, the log for uh, J, log for Shell. So again, um, a lot of people were running and um, trying to answer a very easy, right? Supposed to be very easy question of uh, do I use this and where do I use this? Um, um, this uh, uh, kind of um, um, compound of uh, all at my software, right? Do I use it and where do I use this specific um, element um, and package in my, in my own uh, software? And it was not that easily answered by a lot of people and a lot of security were, um, I, I say like in a tough spot, right? Because some uh, someone were asking was asking them, do are we, um, you know, do do we need to be concerned about this? Uh, a lot of executive would have asked their uh, application security, and and not many could uh, easily answer. And so this is kind of um, what brought us to this uh, study. Okay, so the first thing we wanted to ask was why SBOM um, is failing? Why couldn't we go to our SBOM and just uh, uh, check and see whether or not we have this or that and answer quickly? So this is an example um, of 
how uh, SBOM uh, created by uh, uh, this is CDX gen. So <clears throat> this is the actual code that generates uh, in this uh, instance uh, Python write poetry and Python requirements txt. Um, and how it works is just create Python bomb. It goes over, it looks for all the files that are named requirements.txt or poetry log, requirements.txt under any folder or uh, any folder that has like requirements name and a txt file under it. And so looks pretty uh, straightforward, but then when we look at the um, PIP doc documentation, we see that requirements.txt is usually what these files are named, although this is not a requirement. So again, you can use pip install, you can use a, a pip install with a specific file name, give it a flag, give it a file name, and it would work, it would create your a, a Python a, a application. And we actually see that, uh, you know, in our own uh, um, capabilities, we saw that customers use requirements dash Product, production requirements dash, I don't know, QA, uh, QA or requirements dash uh, staging.txt, and those files would not uh, be picked up, right, by the creation of the SBOM creator. So, so um, these are the kind of uh, things that security, like an organization security, would probably know if there is a different. Um, Let's call it a, um, there's a different way that a unique unify, like in a unique way that your organization works that is a bit different. Um, but nobody would kind of set their eyes to, nobody would ever even think of um, checking all of those unique, unique uh, ways um, to build your, uh, to build your own application and say, okay. You know, if I don't use a requirements.txt or requirements a folder with a, a txt file in it, uh, I will not be able to to see that data in the C CDX gene. Okay, so um, and this is uh, just an example of uh, of pip. There are uh, you know a lot of uh, other examples in in a lot of other ways. Why? Because you know all of those. Um, um, generators of SBOM, they are uh, in a way they are they they have also confinement. They also confined to how they work. In this case, they go over file names. There's no they could not go and check every file um, for the content of the file and then decide if it's a, a requirement or not. Um, just because it's not you know it's not viable. It's not a, a um, they go over file system. They they git clone and they go over the file system and that's how they go by file names. So it's a, obviously a lot of conventions that are being presumed on the way. Okay. Um, so uh, when we go over and, and see what is missing from SBOMs and why we're, you know, at sometimes we we don't have the full picture, so we, there's a lot of things that is missing. That there's a lot of things that we don't really uh, know at the time of the creation and the output from different SBOM creators. Um, that the data is actually there inside the software, but we're lacking it. So uh, a lot of context is missing. What is what context means? internal or external. For instance, if I use a package um, name, I'm not always um, aware if it's an internal package or an external public package. If it's um, transitive or direct import. Um, why? Sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't. But at times when it uh, matters, I need to know because Sometimes you know a vulnerability can be only introduced if it's direct and not if it's transitive, and so I might want to check for all the direct imports of a specific um, module. Okay, um, the application a level of uh, uh, data like controls, serverless functions, relevant annotations. So a lot of uh, those data just kind of vanishes. Right, you don't have the exact controls. You don't know um, if 
if something is mounted into an API or into um, a log logical uh, like um, a logical uh, uh, um, um, let's say module. Okay, if it's if it's something that is like an API gateway, you want to know if it's um, relevant for all the API gateways, part of the API gateway, uh, it's called and, and the module is being used, or if it's for a specific API um, or for a specific control, a controller that it's mounted on. Um, same goes for uh, annotations, right? You want to know if an annotation is um, being uh, used over some specific API, so all of those API kind of specific um, modules and, and are they being called or are they being um, annotated for, for you know, not being used or being used? So all of that data is kind of missing, even though it's, it's right there in the code. Um, and also code owners file a lot of time is not picked up, even though it's also very crucial, like which team or which um, person, specific person owns that in all of that modules, you know, it's just uh, doesn't uh, show up as part of the information. Um, and organization conventions, again, I said that like a lot of the time, there's a lot of data to be um, getting there. For instance, if you have slash test somewhere in, uh, in a specific way or, or just generally inside the path, does do you take it under consideration or not? Does do you have a mock um, file? Is it uh, added as part of the application or not? Um, or is it marked as a mock file and, and mock data? Um, and so on. Okay, so um, taking a, a look back and, and from and taking it from the attacker perspective, so. All of this uh, comes together as, as uh, basically uh, contributing to being the fastest growing attack surface. I think it's fair to say that supply chain attacks are, um, you know, are being, uh, we see it, I, I feel it, and I, I hope a lot of, uh, of you could, uh, agree that it's the growing, uh, fastest growing attack surface, and it's not, you know, with no, uh, without a good reason. First of all, there's a lot of public uh, data to harvest. You can just go on, go to like NPM is a great uh, example uh, because it's a very big um, like pool of data, but it's true for for uh, any other. Uh, it's true for pipeline, so for uh, Ruby gems, and so for a lot of uh, of others. Um, but there's just so many public data. You just go to GitHub, you look by technology, you look or, or, or NPMJS, and you look what are the most downloaded, what are the most uh, um, contributed, what are the most, um, let's say, uh, the most uh, maintained, like has a lot of maintainers, what has the least of maintainers, what is uh, uh, being like, and then you cross a lot of those. And then you have a full list of, um, great uh, subject for attack, right? You can either attack by um, saying, you know, trying legitimate ways, which we see also people uh, like attackers come, coming up and saying, you know, I see that you have this project is not maintained. Let me maintain it for you. Um, I have a lot of ideas, whatever. And then they get transferred the um, maintained, uh, maintained, and credentials and then from there you know they they can do whatever they want with the code and and they do and the other ways of just trying to um, look for emails that are invalid and then you can uh, try to take over the email and take over the account or um, you know however you see fit there's lots of ways also you know there are many um non-maintained uh, projects that are just, you know, you can just give a, a um, contribute to and they might not check uh, in details the, the, the commits that you put in, the code that you uh, put in the uh, project and your malicious code would 
coming as part of a, a legitimate fix um, and so on. Other ways also, you know, you can uh, check if uh, if that project is uh, strict on, um, for instance, uh, um, um, checking for uh, signatures of uh, commits. You know, not every uh, not everyone check for uh, legitimate legitimacy of of commits, and then you can just um, commit as if you are uh, someone else, as if you are a maintainer, and someone else could potentially, if you send a, an email to him, um, would approve that, and so on. So it's a, it's a mixture of uh, of technology and as well as uh, social engineering. And the, the, the potential is great. Uh, there's a great return of in, on investment for attackers. If you get a legitimate package um, over, you know, overthrown with your own malicious code, then you get instantly um, deployed in millions um, of, uh, of applications that use your uh, malicious code. And there are very little security controls for malicious package in, in public repositories. Again, now we see more and more uh, things that are like, for instance, NPMJS. Again, they they are um, they are doing things that uh, uh, we would consider uh, um, a blessing a few like a year ago. Like they're contacting, uh, they're reaching out, they're asking people to do uh, to. Uh, a multi uh, MFA, right? Multi factor authentication for specific, uh, for uh, some um, maintainers with uh, with over uh, this and that uh, downloads per week. And so, so they do much more than before, but it's still very little when we, when we think of it. Just a few months back, the, uh, um, a package that was um, someone that was listing a lot of packages. He, he didn't mean to do uh, anything uh, malicious by that. He, he did have malicious intent, but he didn't have any malicious intent by uh, registering a lot of um, a lot of packages. Um, but by doing that, because there were no like controls over that, he actually created a denial of service for NPMJS. So because that because of the uh, um, the a number of of uh, packages that he was creating, it created you know an organization that uh, have uh, no service for npmjs. That's like that's uh, critical. Okay, that's 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 very bad for npmjs. That's their business. Uh, so legitimate clients could not use. Their packet, their service, or it was very flaky, um. So basically, you know, that just goes to show like how little uh, security was in mind, and uh, when creating all of those public registries, because it really wasn't a problem when they initially were created. People were not misusing them, but now it's a whole different story, and now um, they they have to. And we as, as an industry need to, you know, kind of, uh, and we do, that we need to um, show all of those uh, issues that comes along with a uh, lack of uh, security controls. Um, so, yeah, so hackers going to hack and that's, uh, uh, that's a big problem. Um, so... <clears throat> Okay, so this is a, a bit from the eyes of the attacker and why it's such a big and growing um, issue. And then uh, let's we're going to the um, kind of the uh, the end target of uh, creating some uh, incident response and what's the issue with um, supply chain and incident response. So um, well, supply chain in our top test top ten. So if I look at, uh, at currently the uh, top 10, right, it's the, supposed to be the top 10 risks for a web application. Um, and it is like a, you know, very well known and people look at it uh, even outside of security. Uh, a lot of people uh, know of the project uh, of the top 10. Um, and if I'm looking at it right now and it's been 
um, right, uh, it's been lastly um, uh, been uh, uh, created in uh, 2021. So if I'm looking and trying to find where is um, all of this surface um, currently, so I see that it's very it's lacking. I can attribute it somewhat to vulnerable and outdated components, which doesn't really like specifically talks about supply chain attacks or uh, or dependencies. And I can also maybe attribute it to uh, logging and monitoring. Uh, with, why? Because a lot of the uh, time, the way to uh, handle uh, um, that uh, incident in, incident response is to construct a timeline and say, was this a specific version built during that time that it was available as a, a publicly? Um, but again, it's not really those. You know, it's it's a, I do it like a, um, it's a bit. Um, if if I'm very 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 like uh, openly uh, take anything, so these these are the ones that I would uh, go to. But actually, it's not really addressed, and and also when we think about the um, risks of a uh, of application today, I think it's it's it should be there. And I'm my guess is uh, I'm also leaving it. Uh, in a few moments, I will show like my predictions, but I'm guessing that, you know, in the next uh, top 10, um, which is uh, due in uh, a year or so, we would probably see a direct uh, um, risk of um, dependency, um, generally dependencies and specifically, right? Dependencies, uh, um, malicious dependency, okay? Or supply chain. Um, so in, in this aspect, I want to uh, very, be clear about a few things that we need to understand in incident response. So I want to def, uh, the, to make clear what is a malicious package because there are a few different kinds. And um, I, I, a lot of the time, I, I think people don't exactly understand the differences. So first there's a malicious, what I call a malicious public package. This is a malicious code published on a public registry, which was born malicious. Uh, malicious. It, there was never any time that that uh, package was legitimate in, in any way. Okay, so for instance, there are a lot of um, what we call a, a squatting attack. So people take, let's say, um, I don't know, um, Redux or some very um, known package or uh, whatever, let's say Redux, and then they change one letter or put it in a, in some, uh, or change, or, you know, cross to two letters and and then publish a malicious code um, under that name. So basically that malicious package with the wrong naming was never legitimate in, in any way, okay? So this is a malicious, a malicious package. Now there's a rogue public package, which rogue uh, means that it was, at one time legitimate. So again, like a malicious package, if you see that name in your logs, it means that it, uh, it shouldn't be there. Like it, any times if it, if it shows up in your logs, that means that you've been, um, you've been added or ran uh, or comprised a malicious code into your, uh, into your application. A rogue public package is a bit more uh, hard uh, to understand, to like um, validate, because it means that it, at some point, it became malicious, like the ESLint uh, example, ESLint scope example that I gave. So it had, uh, or oh, at some point in time, it was malicious, and and only during that specific time, and only during that specific um, version. Why is that? Why does that matter? Again, because when you want to try and, and say, "Have I been, um, have I been affected by that?" I need to construct a timeline and say, "During that time was a build built during that time, and if yes, then I might be 
uh, then that's a, a, an indication or a good indication that I have been um, uh, like hit by that uh, malicious code. Um, a dependency confusion is a public a, a package that takes precedence over a desired internal package. So dependency confusion is a bit of both in a way. It's, it's something that if someone were to know my internal um, name or can guess my internal name of packages, it might be able to, um, to confuse my CI or confuse my um, own uh, developer station into preferring to taking the, the um, non-legitimate, right, the malicious code over, over the legitimate code. Um, and usually this was, will also break CI tests. Why? Because usually the legitimate code is not uh, publicly available. So this means that uh, someone who would um, construct like a a uh, dependency confusion attack would try to create a dependency confusion attack, would need to guess or would need to uh, just uh, upfront not do what the package was supposed to, do, to be doing. So that would mean that a CI would fail. Um, and uh, at last, there's a, a vulnerable package with like log4shell, right? Log4j. Um, which is not malicious, uh, um, but has a vulnerability. And we might want to be able to know if it's part of the or part of my application or not, but it's not an, um, an indicate, it doesn't mean a breach. Okay, a vulnerable package does not mean a breach. So if I'll go over this um, <clears throat> quickly, right? So a malicious package, is a breach, a rogue package, which was constructed in CI. If I have um, um, any kind of indication that this code was run in my application pipelines or uh, reached the application um, um, whichever environment it may reach, um, then that's also an indication of breach and dependency confusion the same but vulnerable package it is not a breach why is that important because a lot of the times um, we need to understand that a malicious code that ran in our either ci cd pipelines or in uh, it's been comprised and built into our application it requires incident response it is not it cannot be fixed by an update Okay, so this is like, a, if you need to take one thing out of this um, lecture, it is that breaches cannot be fixed by updating. Okay, it needs to be um, checked and it, needs to, it requires an incident response where, where you need to validate whether or not this, uh, you, you need to uh, maybe take some action, okay? Um, an action could be to rotate keys. An action could be to I don't know to check uh, further if if credentials were used out of uh, um, in some place that you do do not expect it, uh, or check your logs. Um, and vulnerable package by itself, it is not an indication of a breach. Um, again, there are you know log4j for instance was a very specific case where we knew that a vulnerable um, issue was being used uh, in the wild and so on, but still it is not an indication by itself. It's not an indication of breach. Usually when you check for vulnerable package, there's hundreds and thousands of those in, in any source code. It doesn't mean that, uh, it doesn't mean a breach, okay? Um, okay, a bit about uh, uh, what's at stake. Um, Again, because I am going further and, and to understand the what is actually required for application security teams to do at at uh, any at any actual uh, um, kind of an attack. So first of all, um, 
there is an, an initial tri triage, like an alert, if there's an indication, there is some uh, feed that tells uh, there, there has been um, a malicious package live and so on. And so uh, first there's a triage, like do, does it even uh, affect us? Do we use NPM or not? Do, uh, and, and so on. And then we need to identify kind of the first line of attacks. So um, for usually those in, in those kind of attacks, it's the CI credentials. Have they been used? Have they been leaked? And what does the actual malicious code does? Does it exfiltrate information outside? Does it uh, create a backdoor into our application? Does it create a backdoor into our production? Um, and, and so on. Um, and a lot of the times what we're missing is the developer credentials. What does that mean? Um, we need to remember that in order for a, a package to reach CI and to have an indication at our um, later stages of the application, it first was probably built inside the developer um, station. Right, he, he created, let's see if we're talking about NPM. So he'll do an NPM install first on his own um, computer, on his own desktop or uh, whatever, uh, his own um, developer environment. And that by himself can have a lot of, um, a lot of credentials and a lot of data uh, that could uh, uh, have a lot of significance to the organization. And that kind of uh, is all is a lot of the time kind of left out and forgotten. Um, so we need to check the developer credentials, GitHub credentials, whatever. Um, um, okay. Next, uh, mitigate a threat for first line of assets. So again, we need to rotate keys. We need to kind of think of those first line and then Usually uh, uh, we use digital forensics uh, to see if there are any other um, um, other stages or you know second layer uh, second lines and third lines that also needs to be checked. For instance, if uh, we knew that some uh, credentials of a user, okay, a, a GitHub user were in fact breached, then we might rotate those, but we could also check the logs of if that user did anything on any other um, on any other uh, asset that it's that he shouldn't have okay and so on so um okay a, a, a bit of uh, challenging for instance why it is a bit challenging to uh, investigate packages sometimes they're not there Okay, so this is from NPMJS, uh, the unpublished, uh, their own unpublished policy. I'm getting to uh, the end and uh, hopefully you could ask uh, a few questions. So um, so basically anyone can create, a, let's say a dependency confusion attack, uh, have his code get, um, um, get the, the CI pipeline would get his code instead of the original code by the um, organization, run, run and uh, use his uh, malicious code, and then he could unpublish it, which makes it very hard for anyone to investigate what that code did. Okay, so this is just, uh, uh, so there are ways to tackle the challenge, but it's not always that straightforward. Okay, so for instance, less than 20, 72 hours, he can just unpublish it as long as no one else uh, uh, relied on his own package um, as a dependency. And after 72 hours, and as long as there's no not over 300 uh, downloads in last week, um, and that it has a single maintainer, so he can also unpublish a package and boom, that, got, that code is gone. Also, when NPMJS flags um, uh, package is malicious, you cannot reach it, right? So once something was flagged as malicious, if you don't have the resources to gain um, the uh, code, it will just show you a blank kind of security um, holding. 
um, package and, and you won't be able to get to that code if you if you are uh, uh, you know if you are an application security and you want a person and you want to understand better what that code was doing um, it might be uh, a challenge so keep that in mind um, and also remember that um, there are a certain um, kind of characteristics for supply chain attacks. One of them is that it may affect a lot of organizations. In that case, um, there's a surge in uh, the need for application security professionals, right? So a lot of the time when I was working at, at Enzo and, and, the, and customers were asking us, you know, can you help us with this and that? And I said, like, you know, you pay a lot of money for uh, incident response teams. And they said, yes, but they are unavailable. They have tens of uh, other customers who you know, want them right now. So this is the way for incident response. A lot of the time they have like very low kind of require, kind of uh, um, need and then a peak. And at that peak, it's the, it's the exact peak when you want it. So, um, so it's a bit hard to get uh, um, professionals when you need them, if we're talking about supply chain attacks at large. And also it also, but it uh, makes uh, for, um, um, you don't have to be so um, quick to respond a lot of the times because it is, you know, um, one for many. So a one attack would get a lot of uh, data for many organizations. So each organization, could probably, you know, take it a bit longer to respond, and it wouldn't make much of a difference unless, you know, in the specific case where someone is really doing a lot of uh, um, hard work and created a lot of automations over over the data. Um, and lastly, a breach cannot get fixed by an update. This is uh, again something important to take and remember. Um, Okay, I'm I'm getting a, a, a bit uh, on the um, end of uh, my time, so I'll take questions. I think, um, but uh, just just uh, as uh, as as I wanted to show that uh, um, part of the um, of our predictions, we went and and see those exact same attacks. How are they gonna be uh, behaving on? If we attack VS Code and IntelliJ uh, um, 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 packages like uh, extensions, and we've seen that there's a lot of of uh, interesting ways to attack that. So yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess we are on our final mark, and um, let's take some questions. Um, so. Uh, I know we covered like some of the human uh, side of like how, what are the attack threats and um, incidents? Um, like how do you foresee AI effect on the space of supply chain attacks? So that actually I had like uh, something that I um, published on dark reading about AI. And so basically I think it's, it's you know, it's good and bad like all things, it's gonna, we already see that in terms of uh, um, social uh, engineering, AI is, is doing a great job for attackers. It allows to create a lot of, a lot, a lot of a better um, kind of different language, um, more natural um, way of, uh, of contacting people and, bo and bots and, and so on. But in terms of, um, of uh, defending it also increases a lot of it, it also has adds a lot of value to create uh, um, automations for um, for very different um, SAS kind of uh, uh, ways so um, finding um, issues in code and and fixing them and also creating a lot of uh, uh, fixed PRs what what we call so um, that tremendously, instead of just um, saying there's an issue, giving the developer uh, a fix, uh, uh, that's like tremendous uh, leap. 
So I think, you know, like everything, it's it, at this stage, it looks like it's it's a cat and a mouse, you know, like a cat and mice. It, it can go anywhere and it will help both kind of attackers and defenders at this time. I'd say like without a, a clear, um, I don't think it's clear who it benefits more. Um. Yeah, so uh, I think that answers it well. It's it's a it's yeah. a two sided sword. I <laughs> like uh, if you're stepping on AI. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you, Omer, for this enlightening presentation and sharing with us your experience and challenges when dealing with incidents and threats in supply chain. Um, you made some great points from attackers' perspective as well, like how easy it is to find the attack surfaces uh, through public data and regarding how like application security teams need to be more proactive through incident response plan. Um, we really enjoyed the talk and appreciate your time. Sure, thank you. I wish thank I could you. elaborate more. I have, uh, you know, I prepared a bit more, but uh, yeah, uh, next time, maybe on uh, Washington <laughs> If there was no time limit, this could have been. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Goodbye.